All right, Matthew chapter 19. Let's dig right into the passage, starting there in verse number 1. The Bible reads, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coasts of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, I'm going to park it probably on this first, uh, you know, first six, seven, eight, nine verses of this chapter, because this is a really important doctrine and point to drive home. And before we even get into the divorce and remarriage stuff, I want to point out just right from the very beginning, the attitude that these Pharisees had, and it says that, you know, the Pharisees um, came on him, tempting him. So what are they doing with Jesus? They're testing him, right? They're, they're trying to, to find fault with him instead of going to him to learn and to receive truth from. They just want to find some way to bring him down. Their intent is never good. It's not even a pursuit of truth. It's not even a, you know, it's one thing to not receive Christ, but they're just trying to find fault with him as opposed to going to him say maybe they had genuine sincere beliefs that were different then why didn't they go to him in truth trying to talk to him instead of just trying to nail him with something right they go to him tempting him but then look at their look at their attitude look at their heart is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause this is for just basically for any reason you want hey is it lawful just to get divorced because you want to i mean just just come up with a reason and go ahead and do it. Unfortunately, this is the society that we live in today. You know, it used to be, in this country, it used to be very difficult to get a divorce. And it ought to be. Because it's a legal process that needs to happen because when you're legally wedded, you're, you're legally married, in order to dissolve that marriage, you need to go through a, neat, a legal uh, process in order to dissolve that marriage. And Yes, I believe that this should be handled by the law because it is handled by the law in God's law. When someone gets married, you may not see a marriage license because license just means permission. I'm not talking about having that, but at the same time, I mean, there are restrictions and rules on who can get married. So it's not, I'm not even that upset with using that term or whatever. But what do they do in the Bible when someone wants to get divorced? They get a bill of divorcement. And that's something that happens, you know, decently and in order in a, in a setting where someone has the authority to write that bill of divorcement and to acknowledge that and, and for that to, to come to pass. Now, um, God's law also handles what situations are acceptable and what aren't. And Jesus handles that in this very section. And to be honest with you, anyone who wants to know about this issue, because there's a lot of people who are ignorant about this, a lot of Christians, a lot of new believers, you know, just a lot of people in general are very ignorant on this subject. I think, my opinion, Matthew 19 is the best place to show people how God feels about this. There's, this is handled in many places throughout Scripture. We're not going to turn to all those places tonight, but there is so much in just this one short passage that Jesus is teaching, and it has a lot to do with just what's the Spirit? What does God want for you? If you want to know what God's will is, Jesus answers that first. So when he says, they said, hey, can we just put away our wife for every cause? That's the wrong spirit. That's the wrong attitude. Well, can we just go ahead and just get divorced? How about instead, you know, the, the better question would be, is there any reason in which a man may divorce his wife or put away his wife, right? That, that would be an, a more appropriate uh, way to ask the question if you really wanted to know because we obviously see marriage, a union, a joining. I mean, you could read all throughout the scripture and, and how beautiful marriage is and finding a wife and having a... That is glorified. That is magnified. So the more appropriate thing would be like, is there even a reason? Is there any way that, that a person can be, you know, divorced, can be separated from their spouse and it would be legitimate in the eyes of God? Instead, they're saying, well, can we just do it for whatever we want? because that's where their heart is, because they want to just be able to do it for any reason at all. Now, I'll tell you what, too, 
before we get started, this is a topic that causes division. And I think it's just about every single time I've ever <laughs> preached on this subject, I seem to lose somebody. It's just the way it works because people get upset by that. Now, I don't think that's going to be the case tonight. We don't have a very large crowd tonight, but I've had people approach me about this, people who just started coming to church. I've had, you know, questions, and I'm never going to lie or back down on what the Word of God says. Not even to keep somebody coming to church longer. You say, but Pastor Persons, wouldn't it be better for them if they could stay in church and if they could just grow by other things, even if they don't get that one right? Not if it means censoring God's word in order for them to do it. You know what's better? It's to let them know the truth before they go and make a mistake. Now, if they go and make a mistake after they know the truth, what else am I supposed to do? I'm not going to withhold that from them, though. No way. Because then what are you going to pick and choose to preach out of God's word? Who am I to withhold and, and, and decide what's better for them? You know what's better for them is for them to hear the truth. That's what's best for anybody. And the sooner the better. So no, we're not going to withhold on, on teaching on this subject because it's also extremely clear. I remember a case where I was back in Arizona where I was, I was counseling a young unmarried couple that were planning on getting married, but they were asking about it and they were asking my advice. And I asked if either of them had ever been divorced and they said yes. And I said, well, here's the thing. And I said, and I turned to the Bible and I started reading this passage. I didn't even have to give an explanation or expound on it. And the woman's just like, well, we can't. And the man didn't, he wasn't getting it. I was trying to explain it to him. And she, it was just like, because it's that clear. Because, because you don't need to expound on this stuff. You can just listen to what Jesus says. That ought to be enough. But you know what? I'm going to go ahead and expound on it anyways. Because people have such a hard time with this. And the reason why people have a hard time is just because it's something that's emotional. It's something that's very, very personal. And it's something that goes down to, you know, real deep inside of you. If you're, if you're already have been in a relationship with somebody for a long time, maybe, and you find out, I can't marry this person when you were fully intending on doing that, that hurts. I mean, that's going to dig deep. But you know what? Do you love God more? Or do you love that person more? And are we going to have enough faith to know that this is in here for a reason, just like every other commandment of God is in the Bible for a reason. And you could try to stop your ears and shut your eyes and pretend like you don't know the truth and just go ahead and walk straight into sin and hope for the best and hope it all works out. But I'll tell you what, it's probably not going to. It's not going to. It's not going to work out the way you think it is. Even more so when you know the truth and just go ahead and do it anyways. But let's take a look at this. So they ask, can a man put away his wife for every cause? Jesus answers them, verse number four, and he answered and said unto them, have ye not read? And I just love that phrase. I love every time Jesus says that because the answers are already in the Bible. He's like, why are you coming to me? And especially with something so basic and simple. Like, haven't, you, haven't you read? And he's going to go back and quote Genesis. Like, hello. The first book of Moses. How about, how about we start there? Haven't you read? How about we go back to creation when God made man and woman? Like, like haven't you at least read that? I mean, isn't that something that, that the youngest of children start to learn? Hey, God created everything and he created the animals and he created the earth and, and he created man and he created a woman and they got married and had babies. And, you know, like it's, it's the most, some of the most elementary basic things. And Jesus is rebuking him. He's like, haven't you read? Haven't you read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And there we go with the, you know, who's going to get married? The male and the female. Very simple. A man and a woman. And this isn't those who identify themselves as a male. It's who God made to be 
male and female. That other nonsense isn't even referenced in this book because that is beyond stupidity and really deserves no <laughs> mention. <laughs> I, I wonder if that is something that is just completely unique to, to our day and age. I mean, the Bible says there's no new thing under the sun, but, but that level of just, I, I, it's hard to fathom. It's hard to fathom. I mean, were people really ever that stupid? I sure hope not. But probably. So he says, they made, he, God made them at the beginning male and female. Verse 5, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So the whole purpose of the marriage, he says, is for the man to leave his father and mother, and the wife to come together, and they're going to cleave to each other. It says, and they twain, twain means two, become one flesh through marriage. Verse 6, Wherefore they are no more twain. He said, Once that happens, they are no longer two people, but one flesh, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So, he's quoting the Bible, he's quoting Genesis with Adam and Eve. This He's, refer he's making this a broad application to all marriages. This isn't just unique to Adam and Eve, he's making the application based on their question, based on all marriages. According to this, we can deduce that Jesus Christ or that God joins people together in marriage, that God joins them. That with every marriage, God is joining a man and a woman together and they become one flesh. Now, what point do they become one flesh? When they consummate the marriage. I mean, that's what, that makes sense. The two bodies come together and become one and from that moment on, you are one. This is also important to understand that he's even bringing that up about not dividing asunder what God has brought together and joined together and become one flesh. Because the only caveat that he has, the only time that a divorce is mentioned, and we'll get to that in just a minute, is, is, is with fornication. And fornication very clearly happens prior to marriage. In fact, let's just look at that. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. Notice, there's a contrast there between using the word fornication and using the word adultery. Both carry a meaning. Both are a result of the same physical action, but fornication is referred to as fornication when it's outside of marriage, and adultery is refers to the same exact event when somebody's married. So, if somebody puts away his wife and marries another, the Bible says you're committing adultery. It doesn't say you're committing fornication. It says you're committing adultery. And who would the adultery be against? Not against your new spouse, against the old one. Right? And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. So once somebody has been put away to so accept it be for fornication, then you're committing adultery because once you've been joined together, let not man divide asunder. And prior to that joining and coming together, fornication may have happened. And when you find out about that, that would be the allowance that is in Scripture for a divorce, for a putting away. However, that is not what God wants in a marriage at all, is any division, but that is the one time where it is acceptable or allowed in, law, in God's law. And, and, it's, and it's very, very simple. So, Jesus' answer, when they say, can a man put his wife for every cause? This is what people need to be focused on. What God hath joined together, let not man divide asunder. That's my counsel. That's my advice. If someone's going, well, I don't know. My husband did this and my wife did this. And you've been married and you're thinking about getting a divorce. Hey, what God hath joined together, let not man divide asunder. 
That was Jesus' counsel. And you know what? They're bringing up, you know what they're bringing up? Every cause. Every cause. You know what Jesus' answer was to every cause? What man hath joined together, let a man let, what God hath joined together, let a man divide asunder. But what about every cause? Every cause. He gives the one exception already, too. So you can't say, oh, well, there's another exception. He gives one exception to the rule. And that's it. There is no more. Verse 7. They say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and put it away? So they don't like his answer because he's saying, he's basically saying, no. Hey, God joined together. Don't get divorced. No divorce. Oh, yeah? Well, then how, then how come Moses said we get a divorce? And, then he, and, of course, he goes on to, to explain that in verse 8. He says, he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. Notice the difference. They say, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement? As if it's like, thou shalt give a writing of divorcement. No, he didn't command to give a writing of divorcement. Jesus says, he suffered you, which means he allowed it. It was an allowance that was given there. It was a little bit of grace to those who have really hard hearts that can't get over the fact that their wife, prior to getting married, had done something, and, and you know, they can't get over that. That's it. He's saying, just because some people might have a really hard heart, I'll allow, prior to the consummation, a split, a divorce. It's, it's, it's an allowance. It's not a commandment. He says, but from the beginning, it was not so. He says, from the beginning, that wasn't even allowed. Even that wasn't allowed. So what would be the reason from the beginning for anyone to ever get a divorce? There wasn't one. After the law came, after Moses, one reason. Yet today, people want to divorce for every cause. Matthew chapter 19 says it all. If you can't get your heart right after reading this passage, after reading what Jesus Christ said, you know, I don't know what anyone can do for you. It's very clear. There, there is no, oh, well, that's just your interpretation. There's like no interpreting here. It's literally what Jesus said. The only people that, that misinterpret things are people who want it to say something else. You don't like what it says, so you have to come up with some other explanation, some other reason to, to make this say something it doesn't. Because people want to just have their ears tickled and, and feel good about themselves or whatever, or just do what they want to do. But according to Scripture, and, and you know, this is important because this isn't just getting a divorce. This is also who you marry. So if you're single, let's say, well, I've never been divorced before. Yeah, but has the person you're interested in ever been divorced before? Have they been put away? Because they're bound by the law till death do you part. And that's why they commit adultery. They're bound by the law. God's joined together. They've become one flesh. They've become one person. And when you start going around then to other people, that's when the adultery happens. And that may not be popular today. People want to treat marriage as boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, plus. But... I'm sorry, it's just the way it is. And, if, and you know, we ought to treat marriage with, with sanctity and, and, and exalt it and promote it and, and keep it holy and separate from, from the world. But let's keep reading here, verse number 10. So now his disciples, I mean, they're blown away by this. And, you know, I think this speaks a little bit also to the culture that they were living in back then. You know, I think we oftentimes like to think about, well, in the Bible times, people are all real holy and spiritual and everything else. No, they weren't. They weren't. I mean, there may have been some people, but I mean, this, even the disciples are going like, verse 10, his disciples say to him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it's not good to marry. <laughs> and like, like, whoa, wait, well, you mean we can't? Because they're like probably with the Pharisees. Oh yeah, every cause, right? Because that's what the Pharisees are and that's what they're, they're hearing all the time. And then they're like, wait, you mean we can't just, I mean, if it's not working out, I can't just divorce my wife? 
Well, I don't even know if I want to get married then. <laughs> but what a, what, a, what a wrong attitude to have. Yeah. Right? Like, hey, if it's... You, you need to be dedicated. If you're going to make the vow, mean it. There's, there's nothing that should come in between there. I mean, that's a, that's a really important uh, message. But then Jesus answers, look at verse number 11. He says, But he said unto them, All men cannot receive the saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now he brings up, obviously this is correlated with this whole divorce and remarriage thing. And what is, it, what is he talking about? Well, if someone gets divorced and he brings up, hey, if you marry someone that's divorced or if you get divorced and married, you're committing adultery. Well, what's the alternative to that is you're not going to have that relation anymore. Because first of all, you're not going to get married so you don't commit adultery. And second of all, you're not going to commit fornication because fornication is wicked anyways and, and it's already taught against. So what that means is you have to remain celibate. If you've been divorced, you have to remain celibate. That's why he brings up eunuchs. Now, what's a eunuch? A eunuch is someone who essentially has been castrated. So a eunuch is automatically going to be celibate because they're castrated. They can't, you know, they can't do the act. So he brings up eunuchs to further explain that that's how you got to be when, <laughs> if you have the divorce, right? He's not saying you actually have to, you know, undergo a surgery to, to, to have that happen. But he's, he's just talking about because you're withholding from having that relationship, you're like a eunuch. So he says, there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. That's the people who, you know, that's, that's against their will. They were made eunuchs. And there were kings and, pe and just kind of powerful people who would make eunuchs because they needed someone to be in charge of, say, like their wives and their women and their treasury and like all this other stuff. And one, they didn't want them to be corrupted by women or they didn't want them getting involved. You know, they're, they're put in situations, sensitive situations where they wanted to be able to trust them. So one way that they thought they could do that is by castrating the person and, you know, making them not stray uh, in that way. So. Um, that's one way. That's, there are people like that that exist. And then he says, and then, there's, and then there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And I think that this would be a last category of like, you know what? This is what God said, so I'm not going to do this. I'm not going um, to look for marriage. I'm going I'm to stay out of it. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. That's the whole purpose of him bringing up these eunuchs is to, is to explain that situation. Of course, you've got uh, Johnny Nixon, who thankfully I haven't seen anything about that guy in a long time, who came out with that uh, Born That Way Ministries or Burn That Way, whatever it's called, the, the, where he's trying to explain that this passage is saying that sodomites are really just eunuchs and that they were just born that way to, to not engage in any activity. Well, that's just nonsense. That's, that's not what it's talking about at all. This is talking about marriage between a man and a woman who God has joined together, and then people getting divorced, and then remaining celibate. It has nothing to do with any perversion or sodomy or anything like that. So, anyways, I don't want to spend any time on that. That guy's just a, a weirdo anyways. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 13. Then there were brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. I find this really interesting because just last week we saw in chapter 18 that they were asking about, you know, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus Christ called a little child in the midst of them and says, Hey, you need to be like this little child. Right? And he's kind of exalting how little children are. And he's using little children as an example of how to be greatest in the kingdom of God. And now when little children are being brought unto him, his disciples are rebuking him. No, no, no. You can, you know, he's, and he's saying, look. So he has to emphasize the point again. And he says, suffer. Remember, we, we just looked at the word suffer. Suffer means allow. Allow the little children. 
Allow them to come here. Don't forbid them. Don't rebuke them. Allow them to come in. Suffer little children and forbid them not. Don't forbid them. Don't say they can't come here. I want the little children. Yeah, I want all the little children to come unto me. Suffer little children, forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And this is where we get our mindset and our attitude for having a family integrated church service. We don't want to split up the families. We want to suffer. And sometimes, you know what? You have to suffer the little children. You have to suffer them because they're little children. So, so what does that mean? If we're going to have little children here, and obviously I'm not Jesus Christ, but I'm supposed to be preaching Jesus Christ. I'm preaching the words of Jesus Christ. So I'm not going to withhold that. We shouldn't forbid the children from hearing the Bible, from hearing Jesus Christ taught and preached in church. So we're going to allow the little children. Yeah, sometimes they might make a little bit of a fuss. Sometimes they might be a little distracting. Sometimes they might make a noise. Right? We're going to try to keep that to a minimum, but at the same time, you just have to allow it. You have to be able to suffer it because Jesus wants them there. And think about this, because I understand the mindset. I understand people who want to say, no, 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 they, they're just a distraction. They're just going to go. Other people need to be able to learn. Okay, I understand that we can't just have a free-for-all. We can't have a circus. We can't have things just out of control where no one could hear the teaching because there's just so much noise. Granted, I, I, but is that ever the case in church when we have children present that no one could hear anything? Now, are there some times where we hear a little voice or a little cry or, you know, of course there is. But does that just mean, oh man, I could just can't hear anything during church? No, it's not. It ought to be run decently and in order while you're suffering the little children to come. Do you think Jesus operated decently and in order when he was on this earth? When people came out to hear Jesus Christ, do you think that he did it orderly? I mean, we see it pretty orderly. We see when there's a large, large group, what does he do? He, he assesses the situation. He might go up in a mountain, right, to be able to allow people to hear him better. He goes off into a ship, goes a little bit off the shore to be able to, to make sure everyone could hear. He handles every situation decently in order. But what happened when Jesus Christ fed the 5,000 or the 7,000? What did he do? Well, one thing he did, decently in order, he said, make them all sit down in companies. Right? He had them all sit down in little groups. And what does the Bible say? It says when they fed the 5,000, there's 5,000 men, uh, not including women and children. You know what that tells me? When Jesus was preaching, when Jesus was holding his service and everyone came to listen and learn from Jesus Christ, there were women, children, husbands, men, all there present. Jesus suffered the children to come unto them. Otherwise, how were they eating with everybody else when he fed the 5,000? They were there. They're obviously here. People are bringing their children when they go to listen to Jesus Christ teach and preach. The children are right there with them. And what does Jesus do? He says, no, allow them, suffer them to come unto me. See, the disciples aren't saying they couldn't be anywhere near Jesus. They just didn't want him going up to him and being a nuisance, right? This is what they're thinking is that, you know, oh, Jesus can't be bothered with these little children because he's important. He's got a lot of things going on, right? And Jesus says no. But see, these days we got people going way on the extreme of they just can't even be anywhere near the pastor or in this auditorium. Now, I don't think that most churches who have that reason it's, it's because the pastor's puffed up. I'm just saying that they've gone too far in trying to keep an orderly church by ending up forbidding the little children to come and to hear the teaching and preaching that they need to hear. They really need to hear it. Not to mention all of the other repercussions and problems that go along with separating the kids from their families, the kids from their parents, and putting them off in another room in some closed door in some nursery with some stranger, with some person. In many cases, they hire people from the outside. But regardless, whether they have someone from the inside watching or someone from the outside, I don't know that person. You, don't, you probably don't know that person. And I'll tell you this much, especially in, in the dark times that we live in today, there's no way I'm letting anyone watch my children. I'll let my parents, because they raised me. I know, I, know, I, know, I know them well enough. That's about it, parents. Really, really close family. And that's, and that's my, you know, my thing, but everyone has to decide who, who you're going to allow your kids to be around. 
You hear about kids being defiled all the time, especially in churches. I don't want my kids yanked away from me, separated from me. How about just going into a church and visiting? We visited plenty of churches when I had children before I started pastoring churches and, and, and you know, going and visited places. Oh, yeah, hey, you know, there's a nursery over here. That's okay. We'll keep out your kids with us. Like, I don't know anyone in this church. You think I'm just going to go and be like, oh, okay, here you go. <laughs> You're crazy. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even necessarily know what you guys believe about stuff. And you think I'm just going to drop off my kid? No, uh If they ain't staying with me, we're all leaving. No, Jesus' attitude was suffer little children, forbid them not to come unto me. He wanted them there. He didn't treat, and look, he didn't treat them as a nuisance. So what are they doing? People were bringing the little children because they wanted him to put his hands on them. They wanted a blessing from Jesus on their child. Nothing wrong with that. So Jesus rebukes his disciples for rebuking them and saying, no, allow them to come. And then what does he do? Verse 15 says, and he laid his hands on them and departed thence. So he did. He laid his hands on them. He took the time. Was he leaving? Yeah, he was leaving. He had somewhere else to go. But you know what he did? He took the extra time to lay his hands on some kids and bless them. Why? Because they're important. Our children are important. They're not just to be brushed aside and treated as a nuisance and just, oh man, I can't believe we have to have these kids here. Suffer the little children. Really important. Of such are the kingdom of heaven. Verse 16, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So now we kind of switch gears in the story here a little bit. Someone approaches Jesus Christ, uh, this rich young ruler, he comes to Jesus and says, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? What a great question, man. Man, I wish I had more people just coming up to me and asking me that question, right? Because we're always going out and asking people, Hey, do you know what you have to do to have eternal life? This guy comes to Jesus and says, hey, what do I have to do to have eternal life? Verse 17, but right off the bat, see, Jesus is very perceptive. He knows how to deal with people. He's God in the flesh. He, he, he is very astute and in tune and, and understands a lot of things. We see how Jesus knows people's thoughts. Jesus really understands. So this guy comes to him and Jesus already knows a lot about this guy. And he says, uh, why callest thou me good? So the very first thing, before he even answers the question, he's like, well, wait a minute, why are you calling me good? There's none good but one. That is God. Now, there's two ways of understanding what Jesus just said there. One way of understanding that is to say, well, wait a minute, Jesus is rebuking for calling him good because he's not God. He says, well, God's the only one that's good. That's the way the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons will understand this passage. The other way is Jesus saying, well, why are you calling me good? Because there's only one that's good. That's God. Do you believe I'm God? Because he is. It's real easy to settle this, though, because anyone that's going to say that Jesus is not God has to believe that Jesus is not good. And I'm still waiting to hear the Jehovah's false witness or the, the Latter-day Church of Satanist say Jesus is not good with their own mouth. They won't say it. They don't want to say it. But that's exactly what they believe when they say he's not God. Jesus said, you can't have it any other way. There's only one good, and that's God. So the question is, was Jesus good? Amen, he was good. You better believe he was good because he was God in the flesh, because the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then he goes and answers his question. See, right off the bat, he's saying, well, wait a minute, do you even, do you even believe that I am good? You know, that tells me, hey, it's, it's kind of important to believe that Jesus is God. Because if you don't believe Jesus is God, you've got a different Jesus. You've got another Jesus. You've got another gospel. You can't be saved. Can't be saved. What do I have to do to be saved? You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. You have to believe that. It's important. Teach that. If you don't teach that when you go out soul, you better be teaching that. You better show people that Jesus Christ, yes, while he's the Son of God, simultaneously he is God in the flesh. You've got to have the right Jesus. So that's the first thing he addresses right off the bat. But without even waiting for a response from the guy, he says, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. 
Now, other people might stumble at this and say, like, what? <laughs> what do you mean, keep the commandments? I thought, you know, I've been told over and over and over again, it's not by the works of the law, it's not by the deeds of the law. We can see so many verses that say, it's just by faith, it's just believing. Why would Jesus say that you got to keep the commandments? Because of the, guy, the way the guy answers. Because Jesus knows where his heart is. Now, first of all, when Jesus said, keep the commandments, that is true. There are two ways to be saved and go to heaven. One is to live a perfect life. Because if you live a perfect life and you never sin, why would you be damned to hell? Jesus came and lived a perfect life and he never sinned. He didn't deserve hell. He's perfect. So if you can do that, God will let you into heaven. Or, <laughs> the other option, if you've already sinned, you've already broken the commandments, you already deserve a punishment, then you can get salvation by grace through faith. Then you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. So, is Jesus lying to the person when he says to keep the commandments? No. Because what is he doing? He's proving a point. He's proving a point. I don't know about you, but before, when I try to give the gospel to people and try to tell them how they can be saved, the first thing I do, before I ever even get into believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, I establish that that person's a sinner that needs to be saved. That's the first thing I do. So, Jesus is doing the, doing the exact same thing, maybe using different words than you would use, but he's doing the same thing. He's saying, well, keep the commandments. So then he says unto him, verse 18, which? Well, okay, well, which commandments? Uh, how about all of them? <laughs> it's not like, like any more, like, well, which commandments are really important? They're called commandments, right? You're commanded. It's not like there's some commandments and some suggestions. They're all commandments. What a stupid question. But again, people who want to trust in how good they are and in their works, they want the bar set really low. Right. So, well, well, I mean, which ones do I got to follow? Because right off the bat, he's probably thinking like, I don't think I've kept all of them, but okay, which ones? Where, what exactly do I have to keep? Jesus answers him. Verse 18. Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He only lists the latter five commandments. That's all it takes. There is not one person alive or who's ever lived that has not broken at least one of those commandments. You know what I think the easiest one to break is? Love thy neighbor as thyself. Do you think it's easy to love someone as yourself? No. You can say, is it easy not to murder? Okay, yeah, probably. I think, I think it's pretty easy not to murder. There may be some, some circumstances where it may be more difficult, but overall, not many people are put in those circumstances in general where you're just like, man, I need to refrain myself from murdering somebody. Right? <laughs> Hopefully. That's been the case with me, at least. I don't know. I haven't really felt like I just needed to murder somebody. But, and even committing adultery, I mean, that one is a lot more likely to happen. But really, you ought to be able to keep yourself from committing adultery. Like, is that really such a high standard to say, I'm not going to commit adultery against my spouse? Like, just because people are getting more and more wicked, don't like pat yourself over. Oh man, that's so great that I've never like. Uh, of course, you shouldn't be cheating. I mean, that's that's horrible to think otherwise. I, I would say, how low and despicable is the person? I don't have any sympathy or empathy for the person who's going to cheat on their spouse and commit adultery. Come on, that shouldn't be some great accomplishment. Stealing. Now we're starting to get, you notice, he starts with murder, and then committing adultery, and then stealing. We're kind of going into sins that, that get easier and easier to commit. Because stealing, it doesn't take much, really, to steal. It's not like breaking in and doing a bank robbery. That's not the only way you steal. 
You can steal time. You can steal all kinds of stuff. There's, I mean, anything that really doesn't belong to you. You're supposed to be working on the job and you just punch in and just sit around and do nothing and you're expected to be working. You're stealing. Because you're collecting money then for doing nothing when you've got a job to do. It's easy to do that. And then how about bearing false witness? Telling a lie. You show me someone who's never told a lie before. And I'll call that person a liar. And then he, he obviously says, you know, honor thy father and thy mother. So, you know, having to care for them and, and, and uh, respect and care for your honor, honor your father and mother. And then thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Again, another real easy one not to do. Because loving your neighbor as yourself isn't don't do this. It's love them. It's not don't hate them. It's love them. Right? It's two different things. So when you're, you know, showing love for somebody, you're doing something for them. It's, uh, it's kind of like to him that know what to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Right? It's one of those types of sins. It's like, but I'm not doing anything wrong, but by not doing good, you're, you're doing wrong. You're in sin. But look at what this guy answers him with. So, so Jesus just lists those five, and, and you know how many other commandments there are? <laughs> There's quite a few others. And not, not even talking about the ones associated with God, like to love God with all your heart and mind and soul and body and strength. How about that one? Yeah, I want to see someone who says, yeah, I do that. I've been doing that my whole life. <laughs> yeah. So the young man saith unto him, verse 20, all these things have I kept from my youth up. Why, what lack I yet? Do you see why Jesus answered him with, we'll keep the commandments? He's already just thinking, oh, I've done all that. <laughs> yeah, Ten Commandments, I know them. I've been keeping those. What else you got for me? So verse 21, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, wow, you've kept all those from your youth up, no doubt. I mean, you've just been this, this stellar example of a human being. All right, you want to be so perfect? Go sell that thou hast and give to the poor. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. If it wasn't that hard for him to do that, then come follow, go follow Jesus. And another passage says, you know, pick up your cross and follow me. Go ahead. Oh, you're going to be Jesus. You're going to be the Christ. Well, here's what you got to do then. It's real simple. Just go ahead and sell all your belongings and go out and just, just follow the path that I'm following on. Go pick up a cross. Come on. Mr. Perfect. And that's in. He cut right to the heart right there. He was all fine with all the other commandments. And all of a sudden, when it comes to his precious money. Oh, well, I don't know about that. How sad is that, though? Think about that. I feel way more empathy for the people who want to work their way into heaven and they're actually like trying to follow God's commandments and stuff. But something as stupid as money, like, like if, if, if all I had to do to be saved and go to heaven was like, if someone just said, well, you just got to give up all your money and give it to the poor. What's your soul worth? I mean, is it, should it really be that difficult of a decision to make? But we know this guy was a phony. We know he wasn't being honest with himself or with anybody. And he had great high thoughts of himself because people who, generally speaking, we'll see this in a minute, generally speaking, people who have a lot of money are very, have a very high opinion of themselves, which is why this, this person thought, well, I'm great. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't sin. I, I don't do these things. I keep the law because they're lifted up. They're puffed up in themselves. And this is why, Jesus, so it says here, verse 22, but when the young man had heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. He had a lot of stuff. He was rich. He's sad. He's like, I'm not going to do that. He'd rather die and go to hell than give up his possessions that he's clinging to. Man, what a fool. What a waste. You can't bring that stuff with you. What are you thinking? And it's empty anyways. You, you'd think of all people, he would know that. No, I've got these great possessions. It blinds people. Pride blinds people. Riches can blind people. It's another reason why you shouldn't be praying that God will just make you rich 
Proverbs teach us, hey, I don't want to be, I don't want to be poor or rich. I don't, I don't want to be begging bread, but I also don't want to just have this overabundance and oversupply. Just give me what I need, God. And that's, that's all we need. We don't, want, we don't want to be so poor and have nothing so much that we're tempted to steal, yeah. right? Because we've got to eat, we've got to survive. You want to be tempted with that. So we want to be satisfied enough to be able to, to, to not have that be, be even a thought or a temptation. But at the same time, we don't want to go so far and be so rich that we just get caught up with the cares of this world and get lifted up with pride and just forget God, right? And, and think how great we are. Because, you know, you see example after example after example after example of people like that in Scripture. Do you really think you'd be that much different? I mean, really. Even someone with uh, uh, the a heart after God's own heart fell in a really, really bad sin. And why? I believe it's because he was lifted up into a position that's too high for man to be in. It went to his head. He's up walking around on his roof, and oh man, he's got, he's got, he, he has not working, he's just got idle time. Why? Because he has abundance. He's got other people working for him and fighting for him and, and doing everything else and not doing what he's supposed to be doing, and then just got too much time on his hands and does something extremely wicked. And then still wants to cover it up and, and not let anyone think that he's that bad of a person until he's finally confronted with it. And the only reason that he was able to find mercy and forgiveness is because he admitted it. He wasn't like this, this rich young ruler who just went away sorrowful and was just like, well, I'm not willing to do that. You know, when Nathan said, thou art the man, he's, he's like, okay, yeah, you're right. I'm found out, you know, I'm guilty. This guy's just like, no, I'm still perfect, but I don't want to give up my goods. And that's it. I mean, his heart, his heart wasn't, uh, wasn't, wasn't there, wasn't ready. He wasn't even ready to hear the gospel because he didn't even think that he deserved a punishment. Who, what do you need a Savior for then? If you're that good, what do you need a Savior for? That's why, that's why Jesus didn't even get into the gospel with this guy. He's at step one. Realize, understand you're a sinner and in need of a Savior. So he says in verse 23, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. He said it's going to be a rare occasion. He'll hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Verse 24, And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So he's stressing how rare it is and, and, and you know, saying that, hey, it's easier. Think about a camel... And then the eye of a needle is like tiny, right? I mean, what do, you, what do you put through the eye of a needle? A thread, right? Like a tiny little thread goes through the eye of a needle. And he's like, yeah, try putting a camel through that. Now, real briefly, I'm just going to touch on the stupid teaching that's out there. I don't know where it came from. I actually tried to figure out where it came from because I never actually heard this personally in any church that I've ever been to. And I was trying to find out who even teaches on this stuff. But, and I couldn't find out. I don't know. I didn't spend a lot of time in it because I don't like to spend my time in very much foolishness at all. I, I like to know what I'm talking about as far as people who teach this. I know it's a teaching. I saw it's a teaching, but I had a hard time finding like if there's anyone popular today or famous who pushes this idea. But the people, if you know what I'm talking about, I see a lot of people nodding their heads already, but you know, some people will say, oh, well, around the, the walls of Jerusalem, they had these gates, right, that people would enter in by. But then there was this, this one particular gate and it was real short and small, and it was so short that if you wanted a camel to get through it, the camel would have to get down on its knees and unload its, its, its burdens and everything else and, and you know, squeeze through that door. And it was just really hard for it to get through. And that's what Jesus was talking about here. And that is the most stupid, asinine thing. But you know what that is? That's an example. That's an example of people who don't want to just believe what the Bible says and just make up something to either show off of why, oh, you think that's talking about a real cow and a needle's eye? Right. Let me tell you something. That's not, you, pff, you don't know anything about Jerusalem in the time of Christ, do you? 
You haven't been reading enough. I'll tell you what it really means. You know, you got people like that. Or you got people just want to deceive. Or you got people who just don't want to accept what it says. Maybe they've got, a, maybe they have a lot of riches. And they're going like, no, no, actually, here's what it means. Whatever the case. No, it means what it says. It's not that hard. It's, it's not like some weird thing. You're going, yeah, that would be really hard. And not just really hard, because the example that I gave, they just said that that's really hard. Well, you got to get them on their knees. You got to push them through. But you know what? Is it really like impossible? Does that sound like it would just be impossible? It just sounds like it'd be a real big pain, right? It just sounds like it'd be like, man, I don't want to deal with that. Let's just go through the big gate. <laughs> Which, why would anyone even know anything about some gate that would be designed for like a man to walk through and oh, we're going to fit this camel through, you know, whatever. It's, it, it's like for dwarves. And they're like, well, let's fit a camel through there. Like, no, how about we just go around to this one and, and use, the, use the big gate, right? But <laughs> no, but we, know, we know that that reading and that interpretation is completely false besides the fact that that's not what Jesus is saying at all. But he says this, follows up in verse 25, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? Because right, if it's that hard, I mean, how, it's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, let's face it, right? Can anyone do that? No. I mean, I don't care how small you're dicing it up, uh, the, the eye of a needle is really small. Not going to happen, right? Verse 26, but Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible. See, the people try to teach, oh yeah, but you can still get it through, but they just have to get on their knees. Jesus just said it's impossible. Amen. With men, it's impossible. So obviously, that's not what he's referring to. Because then how could he say with men, it's impossible? He doesn't say with men, it's just really hard. No, with men, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So he gives them an impossible situation. Yeah, you can't put a, a camel through the eye of a needle. He's saying, but he's, just, he's using that hyperbole. He's using that manage of speech just to show people like, it is really difficult for a rich person to be saved and go to heaven. They are lifted up with pride. They think they're perfect. They think they're better than everyone else. They think like this rich man thinks. That's why we have the story. And he says, you know what? It is really hard for a rich man to get saved. But is it impossible? No, because with God, all things are possible. No, because the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing even the sunder of the soul and spirit. That God's word can pierce through to the heart of someone lifted up in pride, of someone with lots of riches. God's word can cut right through and pierce through, and that person could get saved because nothing's impossible with God. But you know what? There could be very few and far between. Verse 27, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. So he brings up, you know, the disciples are saying, well, because they just said to this rich one, you know, hey, sell everything you had, come follow me. But isn't that basically what the disciples are doing already? Yeah. Now, they're not doing it for their salvation, right? They already believe. They know it's not by their works. They're not just trying to obey God in order to be saved. But because he said that, he's saying, hey, he told the, the rich young ruler, what he say unto him? He said, Go sell that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. So he said, Hey, if you go and sell all you have and, you know, and come and follow me, you'll have treasure in heaven. So his disciples hear that. I think they're picking up on this and going, Okay, well, what are we going to get? <laughs> right? I mean, he's talking about treasures now. What, what are you going to do for us? And he promises a great blessing. He says, You know what? You guys, you're going to be judging on the 12 thrones of the tribes of Israel. When he comes and sets up his kingdom, they're going to be judging. How cool is that going to be? We're going to, we're going to know exactly who the, the apostles are, the disciples are, because they're going to be judging. So going to be hard, it's not going to be hard to find out where they are. They're going to be on these 12 thrones. And then he says, everybody, 
Everyone that's given up and sacrificed and, and, and left home, left here, left, you know, forsaken these people, very close people, forsaken lands, forsaken money, gave up and sacrificed in order to follow me. He says, you're going to receive a hundredfold, a hundredfold. That's a lot. That's a, that's a, I mean, 100 times what you gave up, you're gonna, he's like, you're going to receive a hundredfold. God's not messing around with his rewards. He's very generous. Very generous. All the more reason to think on eternal things, think on heavenly things, because, man, talk about a return on investment. I mean, we're, you're lucky today if you want to, with your finances, man, I need to get at least like 10% back. How about a hundredfold, right? A right? hundred times what you put in. That's a pretty good investment. That's pretty solid. I think that beats Bitcoin or whatever, right? Whatever you want to put your money into. I know it's probably not even doing that good right now, but whatever, whatever happens to be hot for the time that comes and goes, you know what? God's economy is not like the stock market. It's not going to be like really, really good now and oh man, it tanked. I don't know why I spent all the time out soul winning. I don't know why I was doing all this work for God. I should just go, you know, everything just went down. I mean, there's this global warming and stuff. I don't see how any of this is going to pan out. <laughs> no, hundredfold. God's word is true. You're going to get it. He says, and you shall inherit everlasting life. Of course, you have that uh, as an inheritance through Jesus Christ. Verse 30, but many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. I'm going to cover this verse next week because the, the chapter 20 just continues on the same thought pattern and explains it a lot more. So I'm going to expound on that last verse next week. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for all the lessons that we could learn, for, for all the great, clear instruction and truth that we get from the Bible. Lord, help us to, uh, to just be able to accept your word for what it says, not... Um, try to change any meanings because we don't like what it says. I pray that you would please help all of us if we don't like what it says to help our hearts to get right and, and to just learn to love your word. And um, God, help us to, to show others the right way. I, I pray that you please help our church to grow and to reach more people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.